Hi, I'm Nathan Birma. I want to talk about variety in learning activities in flipped learning, and in particular a resource I've developed called the Idea Box to help us think about different kinds of learning activities that we can do when we flip our classroom. So in this video I want to talk just briefly about some background principles and information behind this Idea Box resource, and then I want to get you started looking at it and finding activities that you could use or finding ways that you can brainstorm new activities that neither you or I have thought of yet uh, between now and FlipCon. So let's begin. So quickly we'll talk about three things. First, the need for variety. Why is variety so important when we design flip learning? Second, what I call pedagogical values. These are sort of guiding principles behind a lot of the ideas that you'll find in the idea box. And then third, we'll simply uh, introduce and take a look at the box itself and some of the ideas it has. So first of all, the need for variety. Why is it so important to do different kinds of things? Well, the opposite of variety potentially is monotony. And there's always a risk that we fall into patterns and we fall into ruts. And we simply repeat the same format over and over. In the traditional classroom, we tend to repeat, at least historically, the lecture. And every time you come into the classroom, you'll be getting a lecture. Uh, what we found when we designed our online classes is that we had some monotony around discussion boards. So every week there was a discussion board, the same kind of question, the same kind of assigned response. That too gets repetitive. In flipped learning, you might be doing different kinds of things in the class than that you did before, but even there there's a risk that you do a discussion in class or a worksheet in class and that you simply rely on that over and over again uh, to fill out your time in the classroom. In any environment. The traditional classroom, online classroom, flipped, blended, variety is very important simply to get people from, f to keep people from falling into ruts. There's actually a danger if we rely on a pattern too much that people simply start responding to the pattern rather than responding to the instruction or to the topic or to a particular process we want to follow or want them to follow in a certain learning activity. So we need to shake it up just to avoid monotony. Similarly, we need to stretch students beyond their comfort zone so that they can't get too used to doing any one thing. Uh, you might buy into the learning styles literature and thinking, uh, you might buy into it a lot or, or not very much, but in any case it is true that students need to learn in different kinds of ways and experience different kinds of learning uh, to stretch themselves. Similarly, to stretch yourself as an instructor. If you're used to doing a certain kind of thing, even in the flipped classroom, if you're only doing one thing, you're only facilitating or you're only evaluating uh, what students do in a worksheet, um, it helps you to branch out as well to try different sorts of things. To put this a little more formally, uh, we, c we need to balance our pedagogical modes. What do, we, what do we mean by that? Well, Bauer and colleagues uh, identify these four pedagogical modes. There are probably more, but these are the main four ones they uh, identify. Transmissive, dialogic, constructionist, and co-constructive. Delivery, discourse, development, and collaboration. Historically, in the traditional classroom, it was mostly transmissive. It was mostly delivery in the form of a lecture. Uh, what we found in our online classroom is that there's an over-reliance on the second mode, dialogic, where most of it is discussion, and we've been working to try to balance it out more so that these other modes are represented. Similarly, you may be relying on one or two of these modes as the primary modes in which you uh, do your in-class time. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but the best learning happens with a balance. And so we can think of this balance as happening both outside and inside. For example, the transmissive happens outside, other stuff happens inside the classroom. But you can even think of it within the classroom itself or within a semester or term different kinds of things you're doing over the course of a semester uh, achieve this kind of balance um, as you have activities that happen in these different modes. So that's the need for variety. Very simply, variety helps students uh, get out of a rut, uh, stretch themselves the way they learn and the kinds of things they're doing in order to learn, and can help you stretch yourself as well as an instructor. So when we started developing our idea box resource, we started thinking about pedagogical values. And the, we came up with this list after we had started to brainstorm different ideas. Uh, so it wasn't overly formal and it wasn't something we set out to do, but we tried to say, what are the common threads here? What are some of the key principles we're trying to affirm in these different kinds of ideas we're, we're brainstorming? Uh, so very briefly, um, we've kept it to a list of six, and I'll talk just very briefly about each one, and then you can read more about it on the website. 
distribution of labor, dividing up the work so that different people are doing different things. You might call it jigsaw, you might call it scaffolding, uh, you might simply call it uh, dividing up uh, what has to be done. Um, obviously there is a pragmatic value here in that you're not simply uh, grading or evaluating or facilitating uh, the same kind of response from every uh, kind of student which uh, starts to pile up and makes for more work uh, and it makes for uh, potentially more monotonous work. So some of the ideas show ways to distribute labor among different students, um, different things that different students will be doing. There's a pragmatic value there, but there's a pedagogical value too. When you start to think about, if you call it jigsaw or scaffolding, uh, the ways that that can foster collaboration so that students are working together and the group is doing something as a unit. Um, and it gets uh, students doing different kinds of things uh, so that we start to have that balance maybe even in a particular task or assignment. Uh, so distribution can have pedagogical benefits as well. Raise the stakes. Can we raise the stakes for students, what's at stake, uh, when they work on something or submit something? Uh, historically, traditionally, a response by a student, a paper or a discussion post on an online course uh, might only get read by the instructor or some or most of, of uh, the student's classmates, uh, but there's, there's not a lot that feels uh, to the student perhaps that it's very important or that much is at stake. And the point is not simply to grade more or, or try to uh, have more consequences. The point is to say, uh, if we can have a more public forum in which some of these things happen, uh, then the student will feel more uh, stimulated or motivated by the fact that there's a wider audience, um, but also that there's uh, more importance or more lasting value to what's going on. You'll see some examples of that. Rhetorical register. How do we get students from lapsing into a sort of a default standard academic or, or school mode? How do we help them find their voice and experiment using different kinds of writing or speaking voices or rhetorical styles to stretch them rhetorically? Oral presentation. Uh, especially once we get into secondary and higher ed, there's such a huge emphasis on writing and writing is very important. But in addition to written expression, oral expression is hugely important. Arguably, in professional settings, that's the mode that students will be expressing themselves in, communicating in, um, and so we need to prepare them for that. Similarly, visual fluency. We have students interact a lot with words and produce words, but how can we get them uh, thinking uh, about and looking at and expressing themselves uh, with visual representations as well? And finally, wider net. It's a big internet out there. How do we start to get students to look at just how wide and broad the internet is but also to make critical decisions about things that they find. This is a familiar principle. All of these are not exactly new but as we brainstorm new ideas can we find ways to affirm uh, these core pedagogical values. So that's a little bit about variety and pedagogical values. What I invite you to do between now and Flipcon is to look at the idea box uh, given the link on the website and start looking around. See what you find, see what you like, see what you don't like. Um, these ideas first were posted at our blog called Portable Pedagogy um, and it started as a series of 53 ideas and has only grown since then. Uh, these are ideas that we gathered from our experience, from brainstorming, from outside sources, um, and once we got going we just started brainstorming uh, even more. Uh, so that's the background of what you'll find at the Portable Pedagogy link. What I invite you to do is look for ideas first that you think you can use and deploy pretty much as is, pretty much out of the box, so to speak. But much more importantly, to also look for ideas that you uh, want to adapt or need to adapt in order to make them work for you. I can just about guarantee that not everything in the idea box will work as is. Uh, any good learning idea has to be adapted for its particular environment, for its learners, for its instructor. Uh, so find ideas that you think you can take and refashion to work for you. And finally, as you look through some ideas, uh, think of some, own, some of your own from your experience um, and new ideas that come up. As you uh, look, see some of the ideas that are there, inevitably you'll think of more. That's the beauty of brainstorming. That's the idea of sparking things with existing resources to develop uh, new ways of doing things. So. Uh, start jotting down uh, and keeping track of some new ideas you have and be, pre be prepared to share them at FlipCon. So we'll meet at FlipCon in Lansing in July. I look forward to it. I invite you to start looking at some of these resources now and I look forward to talking to you then.